Fireside Chat, Episode 17, The Other Two First Round Picks, recorded May 8th, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat, featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Welcome back. It's episode 17 and the second part of our draft special. Last week, if you didn't listen to it, go back and make sure you listen to it because it, it'll make this week's make a lot more sense. But last week's show, we profiled the Flames' number six pick, the only pick we know for sure what spot they'll be in, and also talked about general drafting strategy for the Flames, what we think they should do with the rest of their picks. And on this week's episode, we're going to profile the Flames' other two picks. And as usual, to help me with that, we've got Lucas and Matt. How you gentlemen doing? Very good. I'm feeling... I'm feeling exceptionally helpful. Good. That's what we need from you tonight. So as of right now, we don't know where the Flames are going to pick exactly. Um, Most of the lists I'm looking at have those picks tentatively slotted for 25th and 29th, but it really depends what happens during the playoffs and where things go. So we were talking before the show, and I think we're just going to profile kind of from 20 to 30 in the players that might fall in that area because it's doubtful will be outside of that 20 to 30 range yeah is there any player in that range that either of you guys really like there are a couple i like uh mirko Mueller and frederick gotier you know each one of those is on opposite ends of that spectrum but yeah both players that have a lot of size and you know skill to go with it so yeah, you know, for mid to late round picks, you can't go wrong with those types. What position are those guys? Yeah, Gauthier is a center and Mueller is a defenseman. Though your uh, your boy Gauthier looks like he's going to be a uh, a top fifteen pick the way he's rocketing up draft boards. Uh, seems like a lot of people are thinking he's uh, he's got a bunch of upside. Yeah, I've seen him as high as uh, as 11 and as low as 21 on most draft lists. Yeah, from what I've seen of him, he looks somewhat like a slightly less skilled Ryan O'Reilly, which, you know, you can't go wrong if you got like a 12th or 13th overall pick. So there, There is a guy who's admittedly also rocketing up draft boards, but NHL.com's latest uh, or end-of-season... Uh, rankings have Max Domi as the uh, 23rd ranked, or sorry, as the 19th ranked North American skater. So that, you know, leads me to believe he might be available in that 20 to 30 range whenever we pick. And another, you know, another talented young center is uh, is never a bad thing. And as we talked about last week, uh, the need for some more grit along the, uh, in the organization, you know, He's Ty Domi's kid. I'm sure he plays with a little bit of, uh, uh, as Brian Burke would say, truculence. I'm surprised that you would be going for Domi as the guy who's been advocating big players. Domi's 5'10", 190 pounds. I, I don't necessarily think they all need to be big. I just think they need to be tough. Brandon Prust's not big, but Brandon Prust will, you know, will fight anyone. Uh, you need that sort of you know, toughness, tenacity, courage, whatever. Uh, the other guy I think that I would look really long and hard at, especially if he's available at the 29th pick or 30th or whenever the Pittsburgh pick happens to be, is uh, Samuel Moin. Uh He is a defenseman from Ramouski. He is six foot six, 200 pounds, uh, mean, can beat ass, and uh, you know, definitely fills a, uh, a need for that big shutdown. Uh, and where's he projected to go? He uh, he is the twenty third ranked uh, North American skater. But the important thing to look at with him is mid season. Uh, he was ranked as the seventy sixth North American skater, and he finishes the year at twenty three. So that kind of guy who's projecting upwards uh, seems like a good risk to take, especially at twenty nine. And I mean, six foot six defenseman who can skate uh, don't. You know, they don't grow on trees. 
I'm looking at the International Scouting Service here, and they have Domi actually at 28th. So there's a good likelihood between um, the rankings that we're seeing from all the different sources that he'll be available somewhere in that 20 to 30 range for sure. A guy I wouldn't mind taking a chance on, perhaps with that 29th or 30th pick, wherever it's going to be, is um, and because I think we need to get more than just centermen. Um, I wouldn't mind going after Jason Dickinson. He's a six foot one, hundred and eighty pound uh, left winger who played for Guelph of the OHL, and I've seen him a few times just on video online and stuff. And he he looks pretty good. He had forty seven points this year in sixty six games, and he also played for the U eighteen team. So, um, yeah, he's he's a guy that I would give some look to as well as Ryan Hartman. Uh, who's 5'11", 185, he's a right winger who played for Plymouth, but I've seen him, I think, in two games I watched online, and he he looks pretty good as well. Again, for that last pick, he got 60 points this year in 58 games, and I saw him score some really nice goals. He looked like he had some good hockey sense. Um, so those are guys that if they fall far enough, and we've already taken Mueller, because I agree that Mueller would be a good asset to this team, I'd look at those guys for the uh, the last first round pick. Oh, uh, I was just going to say that I think Micro Mueller is almost uh, not interchangeable, but if he's gone, you might also be able to say, look, if you want that type of player, maybe go after say uh, Linus Arneson, who's a defenseman out of Sweden, who is just a one of those uh, solid. Uh, two-way Swedish defenders who might not do anything particularly flashy but does everything well. Uh, and I believe... He, is he ranked in the top three? Uh, he is the he is the 14th... Or, sorry, he is... Uh, what is he? Uh, he is the 13th-ranked European skater, uh, third defenseman, third-ranked defenseman. Yeah, uh, he's 6'1", 179. Uh, in the... In the European rankings, usually... Uh, the top five usually go in the first round, and then you're starting to, you know, like six through twelve tend to go in the second round. So okay, yeah, you know, like he's ranked thirteenth, so he might be available at the third round pick. Maybe okay, yeah. yeah. All right, maybe we also like I don't know. You move up into the second or something. I don't know. We talked before the show about the Flames using the uh, the first round picks to get a forward, a goaltender, and a defenseman, which some people thought they might be targeting, and that we could use those picks to get a little bit of everything in the first round. Do you guys think it'd be wise to go after a goaltender with one of our f- first round picks? We do have, you know, we obviously do need goaltending, but. Like, Fucale and Comrie, they both, they're not Martin Brodeur or, you know, like, a sure bet, you know, this guy's going to be awesome. And, you know, we already wasted a pick with Leland Irving a few years ago, so I'm not sure that it would be as good of an idea to use a first on one of those guys, especially considering that amongst the NHL starters you can get like half of them are guys that were taking taken in like the fourth round or later so yeah it asset management wise it might be better to take a forward or a defenseman instead yeah I'm looking at the at the defensemen that are around and I think uh Fucale is probably the or the goaltenders that are around I think Fucale would be the guy they would probably pick if they were going to pick one. Um, and if you look in our system, I mean, uh, Red O'Bara is g- going to be in the North American Pro League this year. I think Brassois will be. Um, Ordeo will be. Rama will be. Taylor will probably be let go. So they need some goaltenders. But you're right. They've made blunders picking goaltenders in the first couple rounds. You mentioned Irving. I'm thinking Brent Cron. So just because the Flames have a bad record there of drafting goalies early, I'd wait till round three or four and fill the cupboards that way. Yeah, like even Trevor Kidd <laughs> going back. So yeah, but I mean, honestly, if you think about it, the fact again that you've got three first round picks lets you go out and take 
the best goalie available if you think he's actually got the chance to be a stud. The only thing I would be wary of, on uh, especially with uh, Foucault, uh, is just powerhouse uh, junior teams taking their goaltender. Uh, it, it seems interesting that oddly, in junior hockey, arguably the least important piece of of a junior team is the goaltender. Uh, you look at, you know, your, say, Justin Pogge, uh, Jeff Glass at the World Juniors way back when, uh, who was uh, who was the hitman goalie for all those years? Dan Spence. Uh, like, you can get uh, solid, I, I guess, production, but I, I, especially on a team with McKinnon and Drouin and all the talent they've got, like, it's it's one of the reasons I'm not sold on Brassois as a prospect entirely yet, because he's got such a team in front of him. And I wonder what exactly he's been asked to do. It's funny when you mentioned um, Hitman goalies, because you said Dan Spence. I was thinking way back to Alexander Fomachev, who was, again, a great Hitman goalie, got drafted, and never... I don't even think he's played an NHL game. So you're right, sometimes those junior goalies do fall off and don't make it anywhere i will remind you guys though and i mean matt was saying um you know if he's not ready to be a martin brodeur or whatever but the goaltender that the flames have relied on forever was never expected to be a starter either i mean mika kippersoff was um a third third string goalie when we got him and he really evolved into that position i'm trying to figure out when he was drafted here uh well um, the, what the sharks uh, had a good draft in 94 in the I believe it was the sixth round they picked Nabokov, and the seventh round they picked Kiprasov, and the eighth round they picked Johan Hedberg, and in the ninth round they picked Toskala. <laughs> wow. It, all in the one draft. Great year for goalies for them. Why would you draft four goalies uh, yeah, in just, one draft? Oh I'm just my looking God. here. They, Kiprasov was fifth round, 116th overall. Yeah, I know they had all four in the one draft, though. So, I mean, you know, even by that logic, that if Kipper can be drafted late, there's always a chance he could get somebody else late, and I don't think we need a goaltender to be ready now. We have enough time with the guys coming into the system. We could draft somebody in the late rounds and see how they pan out. Well, well see, that's the that's the thing that actually makes me think that drafting Foucault in the first round is not a bad idea. Because you draft Irving, what, a, either a, like the summer after Kiprasov wins the Vesna? And he's very clearly your guy for the rest of his career. And it's sort of like, uh, why did you... Well, there's no pressure or onus on Leland Irving to really push himself because he knows that Kiprasov's not going anywhere. Whereas you draft a guy like Foucault and you don't nec- you don't expect him to start day one, obviously, but you look at him and go like, look, you play another year a junior, and then come next year, you have as good a shot as anyone to, you know, be the next Carey Price or Cam Ward, and just, you know, start as the backup, and midway through the season, you're the guy, and that's that. And even if he's not the backup, he could be a solid, you know, AHL guy for a couple of years as well. Well, you, you don't take a goalie in the first round for him to be a solid AHL guy. The fact that he the, my my point is that the 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 job is up for grabs. No matter Yeah, it's going to be a crowded crease for the next couple of years though. Yeah, but that's the thing. It's a, it's a it's a crowded crease with nobody who matters. So you throw him into that and it's just one more piece for competition because you don't have anything invested in anyone that would tie you to them other than oh, we think he's the best goalie not playing in the NHL, or he's the second best goalie not playing in the NHL. Yeah, well, the thing that I'm concerned about is that, like, of the goalies this year, there's nobody that really blows me away. Like, I, I've watched a bit of several of the goalies, and they're not as good as the goalies last year when you saw, you know, several goalies go early like in the first round or early in the second and you know like the those goalies last year like even Gillies taken in the third round like I think he was the sixth or seventh goalie taken and like he was clearly 
very decent as a goalie. And, like, I just don't think the crop this year is quite as good. So, I'm just concerned that, you know, they might be trying to shoehorn, oh, we need a goalie, let's get one, type of thing. I think that's a valid concern, but given the given the phobia for taking goalies in the first round, especially in the last couple of years, like, uh, it's it's become almost you know unheard of. Uh, I think the fact that so many people uh, are mocking Fukal as a first round. I mean, it, I think you know, I, I trust that grade. I guess. Depending on whose list you're looking at, uh, Fukal doesn't even rank in the top thirty. I'm looking at the ISS list here, and they have no goalies in the top thirty. So. Matt's point about this being a weak year for netminders, that very well could be. And I'd be curious to see, um, I'm only looking at the top 60 here on a couple different lists, but how close the goalies are to each other once you get down to round two and round three, if they're all bunched up or if there's a clear differentiation. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing to consider, I'm just looking at Foucault's numbers here, uh, a 909 save percentage, 2.35 goals against average, in the queue with that wide open sort of play, especially on an offensive juggernaut like the Mooseheads, I mean, he, he seems to be doing something right. That, 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 I, I think a, a, a 909 save percentage and 235 GAA in the queue is not the same as it is in the dub. Like, they're just, the, the leagues, one league doesn't lend itself to that sort of number. Oh, uh, here's uh, some historical context. In 08, there was two goalies drafted in the first round, Thomas McCollum and Chet Pickard. And between them, they've got one NHL game. Uh, in 2009, there was no goalies selected in the first round. In 2010, Mark Visenton and Jack Campbell were both taken in the first round, and neither of them have made the NHL either. And, of course, the other, the last two drafts, it's way too early to tell. But, you know, like, it's one of those things that you can get value later. So, you know, like, I, like if you look at 08, Holtby was selected in the fourth round. Yeah, and one of the Islanders' backup, Kevin Poulin, was drafted in the fifth round in 08. So, you know, like, you can get NHL goalies later, is what I'm trying to get at, so. And I think if you look historically, goalies do not go in the first round. Like, I think historically the best goalies have always been later round picks. Um, I remember when... DPS, and especially really high, and I'm glad to see there's no goalie ranked in the top five this year because when we've had guys like DiPietro ranked top five, it always strikes me as odd. Um, so, yeah, I can see definitely the pay, the goalies to fall to round two. My worry, though, is we don't have right now a pick in round two, so if you want a goalie that might be in the 30 to 60 range, you might have to take them with the last first-round pick. And that's that's fine. That's you know an acceptable risk. I th- I think though the reason that goalies used to go higher, you know your Luangos, Di Pietros, Mark Andre Fleury going first overall in a draft that was as deep as two thousand three. Uh, I I think it's a combination of urgency and uh, just just the fact that I believe up until or, or at least very recently it feels like. Uh, the first overall pick used to go back a lot. Like, there was, especially in the height of the dead puck era, that even if you got picked first of all, there was no guarantee that you were ready to start. But now, there hasn't been a first overall pick post-Ovechkin, I think, maybe even before, who didn't start and stick with his team the whole year. And the closest uh, question mark was Stamkos, and even, you know, and he turned out fine. Although, I, no, I guess Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson didn't uh, go to his team. But I guess in, in the past when th- there was the... There, was just, th- there just wasn't the, the pressure for the first overall pick to step right in and play. You could take a goalie if you felt he was going to be that guy. 
Well, the thing is, is that um, perhaps the best goalie in terms of talent in this draft is actually a short Finnish goalie, uh, UC Saros. He's only five foot nine, but he's actually extremely skilled. Uh, he had a 1.86 goals against average and a 9.33 save percentage in the Finland, Finland Junior League. And I've seen a little bit of his play, and he looks more dynamic, but because of his height, you might be able to get him in the third or fourth round. So, you know, there are options. Oh he's tiny. He's he's one hundred and sixty one pounds. Like I, I I I love athletic goalies, but I think in the modern NHL when it's all crash the net, you know, through traffic, et cetera, et cetera, rapid change of directions with the puck, um I don't think you can be that small and be particularly successful, can you? Like you've gotta be a friggin' water bug. Well, I think there's three or four goalies in the NHL that are small like that, that are actually having some success. So. Who, who are they, though? Uh, Jonas Enroth, uh, for one. I'm just checking right now to see who some of the others might be. I just would rather make sure I'm accurate than not picking someone that's, you know bigger than they are type of thing. Well, y- Yaroslav Halak and Brian Elliott both look small as far as goaltenders go. Uh, at least they've always looked that way to me. Uh, though maybe Price is just bigger and I don't know. But uh, it, it doesn't seem like you can be a tiny goalie and have success anymore. And if you are, you, again, you're going to have to have some tremendously freakish athletic ability to make up for it. And I don't know that that's going to translate. Even, no matter how much of a freak you are, like, in the NHL when everyone's got, you know, you know, whatever. Everyone's got the ability to shoot, to wrist the puck 90 miles an hour and, you know, pick sprinkles off an ice cream cone. Uh, I don't see how you have a lot of success like that. That's just me, though. I always look at it, too, and I know we've debated this on previous shows, but, you know, not everyone we draft is going to make, nor do we necessarily have room for them on the NHL team. So even if we drafted a, you know, a shorter goalie late round, give him a try, maybe, you know, put him in the ECHL, put him in the AHL, and if he doesn't cut it, let him go. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's fine. I, I just, you know... I think if we're going to give a goalie a shot, we could probably... I, I think there should be other options as opposed to a 5'9", 160-pound guy. Maybe you take two. Yeah, then, or you go uh, then you're, you go the Sharks route and pick four. And, you know, just drop all the third through seventh round picks on goalies. <laughs> fe, fe, yeah, yeah. You never know. The, the Flames have assets to move, too. They could move an asset, get a bunch of lower round picks, and play with them a little mm-hmm. bit. All right, so who else Who else do we like? Um, there's another guy I've been looking at a little bit. I've been watching some stuff on YouTube. Uh, Robert Haig, from, uh, he played for Moto in Sweden. He's a defenseman. And I'm thinking if we can't get Mirko Mueller or we want to get another defenseman, Haig might be worth picking up. He's uh, 6'2", 205 pounds. I've seen some some stuff of him. I mean, I, I'm not an expert. I've just seen some stuff on YouTube. But he looks like he could be an interesting player. Yeah, you can't really go wrong with Swedish guys because they're, you know... The... Especially guys playing in the Swedish men's league. Yeah, because like, you look yeah. at Jonas Brodin a couple of years ago, like he was actually expected to be selected in the back half of the first round, and the Wild, you know, at 10 or 11 or wherever he was picked, decided to reach for him, and he was arguably the best rookie this year. So, you know, there's just something about Swedish players lately that they seem to be a lot better than in the past. So... 
Uh, just reading a tweet from the ISS about Robert Hag. Uh, uh, quarterbacks, the power play is on ice in all critical situations, shoots the puck extremely well, and is a very good skater. Uh, he apparently had some major regressions either at the World Juniors. He didn't have a particularly good tournament. But uh, he's definitely the kind of player, especially if he's available at 25, uh, you know, I think you can you can jump all over him, and you know, right there, that's your your Tim Erickson type replacement. Yeah, yeah. I watched a couple of Swedish games. I always try to watch a couple games from various different leagues every year on YouTube and stuff like that. And I noticed he was, seemed to be always on the ice. That's the one thing I noticed about this guy. He was chewing up ice time in every situation. That's important. We need a minute muncher now that Jay Bowmeister is no longer around. Yeah, that's what it reminded me of. It reminded me of Jay Bowie. He was always on the ice. I was just going to say, at some point, people need to realize that just because you're on the ice a lot doesn't make you... That's not a necessarily... That's not That's not a quality. He plays a lot of minutes. Good for him. Yeah, it's, they've got to be good minutes. Nothing. Yeah. I'm looking at defensemen in this draft because I think that the Flames would do well to pick some defense early on. Um, Mirko Mueller we talked about. We talked about Robert Haig. The other high-ranked defenseman in the 20 to 30 range, I'm not that familiar with. I don't know if you guys are. One is Josh Morrissey, who I've heard some good things about, uh, out of Prince Albert of the WHL. A friend of mine who's a big WHL fan mentioned him a few times. Um, are either of you guys familiar with Morrissey? I'm not really fussed on Morrissey because of the fact that uh, he seems to be dropping in the ISS rankings. He was 11th at the midpoint, and now he's 27th. So, yeah, usually players that fall like that, there's something wrong with them. And I'd rather go with someone that's on the upswing instead of the downswing. Yeah, and a guy, a guy like that that would fall into that category, and this is, again, based on the NHL.com uh, rankings of North American and European skaters, uh, a guy who's up from 30 to 22 for North American skaters is Nikita Zadorov, uh, who is a big uh, Russian defenseman, six foot four, uh, projected... He, some people have him going particularly... like some One draft has him going as high as 11 to Philly, like he's six foot five, two hundred and thirty pounds, and he plays for London. Uh, and you know, it, it, somehow if he managed to fall to uh, uh, the first, uh, the St. Louis pick, then again, he's another guy that I think you'd jump on. But I don't think a guy with his size and skill set is going to uh, is going to last to that long. With that St. Louis pick, do you take Mirko Mueller? Um, or would you, I mean, I think we've all said that we like him, or do you wait until later and roll the dice with somebody else with the St. Louis pick? It really depends on who's available. It, it depends on who's available. Because, like, if, say, like, Alexander Winberg or Frederick Gauthier are available at the Blues pick, well, you go with them. But, you know, because they're... Yeah, well, obviously, if, I mean, if there's somebody quite a bit off the board, you'd take them. Yeah, but, you know, if the best player is Mueller, then sure. You know. At this point, I'm not really overly concerned with, like, whether we take a forward or a defenseman with the second or third first rounders. As long as they're the best player available. Because I think that's vastly more important than, you know, Oh, pigeonholing, oh, we need this or we need that. Well, and and I agree with you, especially in the early rounds. I think you almost have to take best available because while we might say we have a hole, you know, at center or on defense, who knows what's going to happen in two, three years. We might fill some of those holes and then have excess guys. So especially in the first rounds, I think you might be best to draft that way. Another guy I've seen a little bit of, not a whole lot, is Madison Bowie from... Uh, Kelowna, he's a defenseman, um, right-hand shot. I've seen a little bit of him on TV watching some of the Hitman games on Shaw. Um, either of you guys seen any of his stuff, his work? 
He seems a little bit slow to me. That's the only thing is he doesn't seem like he can always keep up with the play. But to me, as a young guy, that can be fixed, hopefully. Yeah, skating issues is never... Like, anybody that has poor skating skills, just skip by them. Because, you know, unless they're Dave Andrichuk reincarnated, like, no. Because those players usually have a very tough time making the NHL, and if they do, they usually aren't there for long. Yeah, skating, especially with a defenseman, if you have skating issues as a defenseman, you need to be, you know, a Hal Gill type with your just awareness of where to be on the ice positionally at all times. Because otherwise, like, even though Hal Gill move, Hal Gill would lose a foot race to a glacier, but he'd be in the right position. Um, and as as far as the draft philosophy goes, I think as much as we harp on centers on this podcast, uh, best player available is the only way you can draft, it, and whether it's early rounds or late rounds. Now, it happens to be, coincidentally, that the best player available based on where we're going to be picking is a center. Uh... But you can't, like. You You're talking can't about the really first pick now, right? Because you, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm I'm just saying as an overall philosophy, best player available simply because, as you've said, your needs change, and you're not drafting these kids to fill an immediate need anyway. So just you know, take the best players available. Yeah, like if there was two players that you have rated as basically equal and they play two different positions, then maybe you decide to pick where your need is. You know, but it it would have to be like two players that are basically equivalent though. Otherwise, just go best player available regardless. With a deep draft like the one we have this year, what do you guys think the chances that the Flames do what they did last year with one of their first round picks and go significantly off the board like they did picking Jankowski? It's possible, but I don't see it with one of the top two first round picks. They might go off the board with the third one. And, like, it would be to select someone like Samuel Moran, who's a bit of a reach, even at, like, 28. Yeah, I I would say that given this organization's uh, drafting in the last couple drafts, they, especially last year, they're going to make at least one off-the-board pick that if it hits, it's going to be a home run. But if it doesn't, it could just... It could easily be one of those, oh, why did you pick this guy as opposed to, you know, X, X, Y, and Z player. But, again, with three first-round picks, there's no need to play it safe. Like, if you think there's a guy who's going to be, you know, a a franchise player or or just a a, a solid NHLer, like, just pick him. It's the 30th pick or 29th pick or whatever. Uh reach a little bit you're you're if if drafting was as accurate as the scouting rankings you know proclaimed there would be no mystery it would just be an exact yeah. science but and, it's not well one thing that uh, this draft has is especially like in the back half of the first round and the second round are guys like Stefan Matteau or you know, like, you're really good third, fourth line two-way players. You know, like, guys like JT Comfer. You know, like, they solid. You you know they'll be in the NHL and be good NHLers, but, you know, not a lot of upside to them. So, you know, there's always that route as well. So, it just depends on what's on the board. We've talked a lot about who might be on the board, what we might want to do draft-wise. Um, let's segue a little bit into potentially the Flames moving one of those picks. Um, I could see the Flames picking with two of the picks, and I don't know which two. I would imagine the first two, and perhaps moving the third one. Um, what do you guys think? Do you think there's a good possibility? I mean, Jay Feaster said he's open to the idea of moving one of those picks, 
Is that something you guys would want the team to to do, or at least to explore? Mm, I would hate if they traded the first one, of, any of the first rounders for a player, just because we're at the start of a rebuild. And like, say you trade them for the pick for a solid. 24, 22 to 24 year old well by the time in 3 years when you're actually good like they're 26, 27 and ready for UFA so it doesn't you know like we're gonna be s- s- bad for a while so I don't see the point in you know wasting the 4 or 5 years of age yeah, like, yeah, the player might not be, is only like a 50-50 chance of being an NHLer, but, you know, it's, I'd rather have that than, you know, a guy that's going to start being too old by the time we're actually starting to be good again. I, I would like to see them draft all three first-round picks. I I don't want to see them trade any of them if it's just to trade down and recoup more picks. I think there's any number of guys on the roster you could move that would get you a second or something. But uh, as far as trade, if you traded a first round pick for uh, a guy in that 22 to 24 age range, uh, I think the the chance to get a contributing young NHL player who, yes, you're going to have to pay a little bit more money to, but on the other hand, it's not like there are, there's anyone on this team who's due for a massive raise. It, 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 any of our rookies, like Brody might be in a couple of years, but there's one guy. I don't think Sven is going to command an exorbitant amount after his first contract is up, but after his next one for sure but that's you know at this point that's probably seven years down the road so i think you can afford to trade one of the firsts for some productive 22 to 25 year old help the uh one thing that i might not i would definitely not be opposed to is if we coupled one of the roster players with the first to move up like if we were to say include Stempniak and or you know any of those players for you know like moving up from say like twenty eight twenty nine to say fifteen yeah I'd look at that because yeah the top twenty seem to have quite a few really good possible players yeah so I'd look at that in, instead of yeah, trading the first entirely, I'd actually move a roster player to get a better pick. But yeah. You know, so Matt, on that idea, it's a toss. On up. that idea, what if you were to package the twenty fifth and twenty ninth picks together to move up to a significantly higher, like top fifteen? Would you be open to that? The Flames doing something like that? No, actually, because I think that even uh, at like twenty five and twenty nine having two players is you know because any of these players could bust so having two shots at it is better than one but you know like if i could move up any either of those picks to get one of the top players then i would go for that i tend to agree with lucas i would be okay moving one of those picks preferably the last one the 29th for a um an nhl player a guy who's ready, but young, who, yes, by the time we're ready, he might be a free agent, but we're going to have the money to pay him. And he could then become that centerpiece guy, be it the top player or just one of those guys that's around and, you know, a member of this team for a long time. I'd be okay at least exploring that. I don't know necessarily off the top of my head who I would want to bring in, but if the right deal presented itself, I'd be okay flipping one of those top 30 picks um, for, you know, an NHL player and another pick later on, a second or third or something like that. To go back to your question that you asked, Matt, um, I, I I would say no simply because while while Matt's right, they could e- they could bust, they could just as easily boom 
and you could get a one of the best players in the draft at 29, 30, or what have you. And I think at this point, having the three assets just gives you so much more flexibility going forward, even if they don't all necessarily play on your team, but it gives you a marketable asset to hype up if you did decide you wanted to move one of those later prospects in another trade. And also, the the thing I'm worried about as well is that, that if you're trading a first for a guy that's 22 to 24, who are you going to get? You know, like, that, you know, like, would you trade Brody for a 25th or 29th overall pick? You know, like, you might be able to get no. someone like Backlund, but, you know... Like, that's not great, you know, return-wise. So, I don't know. If I could get, if I could get a Mac, Michael Backlund type for the 25th pick, I'd do that, I think. Although, that being said, like, uh, we, we really should have done a little bit more research on, who, on trade targets as opposed to just uh, reading up on prospects, because I have no idea who I'd even ask for with one of these picks. I'm just, you know, pie-in-the-sky, theoretical moves, you know, whatever. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm just looking... I'm just looking uh, on CapGeek, and... The New York Rangers are at sixty-eight million dollars. Uh, th this is—I haven't looked at their. Uh, I'm not necessarily looking at their next year's money just yet, but uh, two of their current RFA's are Derek Stepan and Carl Hagelin, and to say nothing of Ryan McDonough and Michael Sauer, uh, and the only expiring contract they have is Ryan Klo, uh, Nash Richards. Uh, Callahan, um, uh, St Mark Stahl, Dan Girardi, uh, Delzato, like all these guys, Lundqvist, are locked up at least till next year, uh, and in several cases, many years after the fact. And, you know, I don't know which one of those guys you target because I'm sure they're not going to let Steppen get away, but those are the type of players that maybe you you look at moving for a late pick well what i would do in that case is i'd actually target one of the more expensive guys because uh, they're desperate to loot shed money so you know why not go for like girardi or something you know in that case though i think there's going to be teams that'll have to buy guys out and you might be better to wait till the buyouts and pick them up without having to trade them that is going to be them. interesting to see who is available just as a salary cap casualty cuz i'm sure a lot of the guys that get bought out are going to be or no, not a lot but at least some of them are going to be better uh than i guess they were playing under the pressure of those massive contracts well, plus the fact that the Flames have so much cap space, you know, with having so much cap space, like, you know, we can just go shopping for, you know, like, oh, you you have too much salary committed, well, we'll trade you, say, Stepniak for, you know, a first liner or, or something. You know what I mean? It'd be nice to win a trade. Yeah, I think if I was going to go after a vet, I wouldn't trade for them. I would wait until seeing what happens with buyouts, because I think the Flames would be able to get somebody decent for cheap. Always. Bargain hush, bargain shopping. Never pay full price for a DVD. All right, well, that concludes our two-week uh, draft overview, draft summary, I guess, looking at the Flames and what they might do in the first round. We're probably not going to have a show focused on the rest of the rounds because we're not sure anyone really wants to hear analysis of rounds 2 to 7. But if there's people out there that do, get a hold of us, Twitter, Facebook, or on the website and let us know and we will uh, consider it. Keep in mind, we barely knew anything about people that were written about. So God help us if we get into, you know stuff that nobody's ever heard of and if there's someone out there that has um an expertise with some of the lower leagues 
um, let us know as well. And if you want to come on the show, we could perhaps make some accommodations there. And while we're talking about getting a hold of us, um, make sure you, if you haven't yet, participate in our Burning Questions contest. Go on Facebook or Twitter, answer one of the Burning Questions, and you'll be entered to win a prize pack. There's more information on that at uh, firesidechat.ca. So unless you guys have anything else you want to do, I'd say let's send this thing home. Hey, Luke, uh, are you sure that you don't want to just make up random things about guys that are in the later rounds, like Taro Samujiosu or whatever, that buffalo pick from years gone by? Yes, absolutely. Oh, yes. I do, I do really want we to. We could do even that. make we up random happen. guys. But now that I've said it, it's not it's it's not it's not gonna be a secret once Well I've... if you hear another draft episode from us, I guess it'll probably all be made up of players and stats that Lucas has come up with. Until the next episode, this is Dan Matt and Lucas signing off. Suck it, Tom. We are the boys of chorus, we hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.